Mm-hmm. Hello, Marianne. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Is all your fans, Marianne? All my fans are in already, yeah. <laughs> 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 Tonight, I thought it was in April. I don't know. Oh, there. Must have read it right. Hello. Hello, Marian. Hello, Marian. Hi. Hi. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is now the sixth talk of our Mourn Memories of Places from the Past talks. Uh, I'm just going to mute everyone. Um, Marion, you can feel free to unmute yourself there if you want. Um, yes, thanks everyone for joining us. So that, uh, as I say, this is the sixth in our series of 10 talks. Um, we've got a great turnout tonight. There's 46 people. So that's uh, that's the most we've had yet. Um, so tonight, uh, Marion McGreevy is going to be talking to us about Lady Mabel Ansley. I hope I've pronounced that right, Marion. You can put you me have. You can put me right. <laughs> Um, just before I pass over to Marian, a wee bit of housekeeping. So we've muted everybody at the minute. Uh, if we can remain that way, if anybody has any questions along the way, please feel free to put them in the chat um, or save them for the end when um, you can unmute yourself and, and ask the questions directly to Marian. Um, but we'll save the Q&A till the end if that's okay. I think Marianne's expecting her talk to last about 30, 35 minutes or so. So plenty of time at the end to get some questions in. So um, I don't, I think that's fine for me now to hand over to Marianne to um, kick us off. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Aidan, and welcome to everybody. Uh, lovely to see so many of you on such a beautiful evening. Uh, joining us for this gorgeous talk on one of my favourite Ansley people, Lady Mabel. Well, there's a lovely picture of her, and I say she's the lady who saved Castle Wellen, Castle Park and Gardens for us to enjoy today. And I hope over the next half hour or so to prove why I think that is the case. But her backstory is a most interesting one. The life and poignant story of Lady Mabel Ansley has helped us to have this beautiful park, garden and to joy today. One that local voluntary historical and gardening groups are trying to preserve for the future generations. This is a genuine Downton Abbey story. The Ansleys have impacted enormously on this part of County Down, physically, socially and economically, but in particular since the late 18th century. For the purpose of this talk and discussion, I want in particular to talk about Lady Mabel Ansley. She was born in 1881 and died in 1959. She preserved the estate during the troubled period of the early 20th century. So who was Lady Mabel? Well, here's a little bit of her family tree. And she was born in London, actually, uh, though she wasn't overly happy about that because Castle Wellen was really her natural home. In February 1881, the daughter of Hugh, who was the fifth Earl of Ansley, who lived in Castle Wellen Castle. Mabel's mother was an Englishwoman, Mabel Wilhelmina Frances Markham, and she was a granddaughter of Sir Francis Grant. And that's a very important and significant because he was a very fashionable portrait painter of the period. And I think really, and exhibited his works in many Royal Academy places. And I think Mabel inherited her great artistic flair partly because of it. And then she herself became a wonderful artist and wood engraver. Well, what of her early life? Well, Mabel grew up in the castle and we have a picture there of her with her mother. And the castle was actually built, the one we know today, that lovely gray granite was built by her uncle, William Richard Ansley. And it was completed in 1856, Scottish baronial design by the architect William Byrne from Edinburgh. And as I said, built of that local granite. William had only a few short years in the castle because he died in 1874, leaving the domain to his brother Hugh, the fifth Earl, and that is Mabel's father. Hugh and his wife Mabel had two children. Mabel, as I said, who was born in 1881 and her beloved brother Francis in 1884. He eventually became the sixth Earl of 1908 and we'll have more about him later in the story. Hugh went on to create one of the finest gardens in the country 
And he really was a wonderful pioneer photographer of his day. And I think also a very big influence on Mabel. And here we have the gorgeous gardens that we know and love today. Well, what about Mabel's early childhood? Mabel really enjoyed her early life growing up in the privilege of the big grey castle, as she called it. She often referred to it as that. She loved the panoramic views over the lake and the Mourne Mountains in the distance. And when you look at that lovely view, is it any wonder? It's absolutely beautiful. She actually talked about it a lot in the As the Site is Bent, her unfinished autobiography that was published after her death in 1964. Mabel, what else about her? She really did love Castle Wellen. She loved animals and she kept, we know, lop-eared rabbits, which lived with the carriage horses and sat around in the stable block with the canaries and the bantam. So it sounds quite a lively place. As I said, in her unfinished autobiography, As the Sight is Bent, she tells a lovely story that her father brought a donkey, got panniers put on the side of it to carry both her and her brother around the lake and around the estate. And we can imagine the servant boy leading this procession around the uh, domain and as they have their stately nurse walking behind. It really must have been quite a scene. On occasion, the group would also go to the Moorish Tower, that picture there in the top, and it actually was like the tea room uh, come picnic spot. And I'm sure some of you have even gone up today to enjoy a picnic in that beautiful spot. And the ladies and the children went there and apparently when they wanted to be collected again after their picnic and their ride out, they lit a fire and the smoke from the castle, they know to come back with the donkey and the panniers for the return journey. What a Downton Abbey lifestyle. Well, what about Mabel's um, education? She had that lovely early childhood uh, that she adored. Well, like many people, Mabel was educated at home and she was educated by a governess. She called the governess the dragon. And as part of her early education, she was actually pleased to be given drawing lessons, which she actually enjoyed. And she frequently drew that lovely outline of the Mourne Mountains that you can see there. She kept coming back to that view. It was a favourite of hers right up into adult life. She was a very talented artist and, as a, and, and in the art world, she has created many fine pieces and is very, very well respected. What about other things from her early childhood? Well, this is the bit she didn't particularly like, because the Ansley family left this lovely house in Castle Wellen and the, and the castle, and they went to Regent's Park in London. And she really didn't like it. It was named Ansley Lodge. And every year in early summer, everything was packed up and they moved there, complete with the servants. Mabel describes the London scene, which I think is absolutely wonderful. Between five o'clock tea and dinner at eight, old fashionable London, in the 80s and 90s were to be seen in Hyde Park. From Marble Arch to Knightsbridge, the carriages rolled. She then tells us how uncomfortable everybody looked in their smart London set with their beautiful, all the ladies tightly laced, the, the coachmen in their tight, pay clipped trouser leathers, the horses with their heads pulled back, bearing reins, and to be whistered lords in their tall hats in our high frock coats wandering around. And we can see some of the actual style from that period. Now, unfortunately, they're not the Ansley family, but they certainly reflect that style. So the next time you want to go for a walk along the prom in Newcastle, I want you just to look at the style that was 1890 style in the very fashionable London. But that really wasn't Mabel's scene at all. She hated dressing up. She much preferred to be at home in Castle Wellen with her animals and out around the estate. Sadly for Mabel, there were very, very significant changes when she was 10 years old. In 1891, her mother died after a very short illness. And rather unusually for the period of time, um, she had a very close relationship with her mother, as did her brother Francis. Her mother played a very important part in their upbringing. But this event had a very, very deep effect on Mabel as well as her brother. And it was a very difficult time for her father as well. Her father wasted no time and remarried. And in fact, within a year, he'd married his cousin, Priscilla here. And Priscilla Cecilia Moore was a very lovely beauty, but she was 35 years younger than Hugh. Mabel didn't have a close relationship with this new woman in her life, her stepmother, 
nor indeed did she eventually with her eventually get two um, half sisters, Constance and Claire in 1893 and 1895. Um, more about them later. They really loved the style and the London scene. So unlike Mabel and of course uh, her mother, her new stepmother lo really loved the London scene as well. However, despite, despite this awful setback in her life, Mabel went on to enjoy the lovely, beautiful surroundings and became a skilled horse rider, going around the local lanes and fields all around and jumping over ditches. And that was really her love. Her horses and her love of art were going to pull her through these very, very difficult years and difficulties in life. Mabel's education continued at home with a governess and her brother, whom she adored, went off to boarding school at the age of 10. He, Mabel then became, she was very, very isolated at home and had very little connection with any children of her own age. And I think this really led to her having huge difficulties in socialising in her early adulthood. Then, in very unusually for her age and an amazing experience, in 1895, when she was only 14, she actually got a chance to attend a course at the Francis Calderon School of Animal Painting in London. And we actually have some slides of it here from around that period of time. Um, his studio was off Baker Street. And then in the summer, which I bet Mabel really loved, they moved to a farm at Headley Hill near Liphook in Hampshire. And it's a lovely scene, isn't it? Such a rural scene and obviously a great influence on her later artwork. But around this time, after a few years of this kind of work, around the age of 1819, 1899 to 1900, for old Mabel, was, wanting, was being really given, brought out into the social scene, once again, her stepmother's idea, and out into the aristocratic world. And she just hated it. That was really not her scene at all. But um, her two um, stepsisters rather enjoyed that. And we can see some lovely pictures from that period. And we see alongside it what the social scene was with that Mayfair magazine of about 1904. What came after that? Well, for Mabel, really, it was marriage. And in 1904, she married for love, not money. And by the way, her father approved of this match. Gerald Sorby uh, was from Gainford in County Durham. He was a penniless flag lieutenant in the Navy. Interesting enough, around this time, she met and built up a great friendship with Winston Churchill. In 1905, another significant change for her, her only son, um, her only child really, a boy, Gerald, was born. Many people called him Jerry locally when they got to know him. Where did they live? Well, at this stage, they settled in a very basic cottage in Hampshire with a toilet outside and a corkscrew staircase. Can you imagine the contrast to that wonderful castle? She was happy there, she says. But unfortunately, she had ill health. After the birth of her son, she ended up with arthritis and other medical problems. And that was hard for her. Her husband also was away a lot, with being in the Navy for long periods, and she was left to cope at home with a young child and her own ill health. Her father, Hugh, came to the rescue and brought her home to Castle Wellen to recover. This was obviously a very good influence on her. She was doing very, very well. And then Hugh decided to build her a house and he built her a house in 1905. And it's the one we know today at 88 Brownsford Road. It's actually called Myrtle Lodge. You can see it on the map here from a slightly later period. And you can see the views and the gardens that I was privileged uh, to visit last week. So uh, a beautiful setting there by the Shimna River. Well, that went very well for her. She was very happy, very content. Uh, with living there and she continued to live there until about 1914. She tried to cope with her son Jerry and that she tells us that he was a very impetuous child. And he stated, he also stated about her that the only thing she ever taught him was how to ride a horse or how to even stay on it. She says that that's the only thing she was ever able to teach him as he always seemed to go his own truculent way. The house that we're looking at, Myrtle Lodge, was later lived in by her sister-in-law, uh, who many people know locally as Evelyn Hester Alwyn. And she died in 1947, and she was the remarried widow of Francis Ansley. But we'll find out a little bit more about him in a minute. 
Well, that's the happy days of Myrtle Lodge and Bryansford Road, and it's still called Bry Myrtle Lodge to this day. What about the tragedies that had to happen then? Well, a whole string of them really for poor old Mabel. In 1908, her father Hugh died and Francis became the sixth Earl. And here's a rather handsome picture of Francis as the sixth Earl and then Mabel with her own brother as well. Sadly, more tragedy in 1913, as Mabel's husband died of appendicitis, leaving her in very deep grief and a long lonely winter at her family home by the Shimla River, that Myrtle Lodge. She was recovering well, we're told, by the summer when World War I broke out. And it started with her brother, Francis, moving had decided was joined up but he sadly was killed in action when his biplane um, a bristol tb8 came down in belgium en route between england and france sadly his remains were never found so we're just going with missing presumed dead francis was married um, but he had no heirs to the estate and it passed to mabel Mabel just never expected uh, to inherit this extensive estate. Along with it, unfortunately, were two sets of death duties. So Mabel recalls coming back to the empty castle. And she states in her autobiography, at the top of the hall, I stood. The sounds of the house were familiar. The rain always dripped like that. And there's always been a smell of ivy and purpuri. A fire had been lit in the back corridor. And when I rang for more wood, instead of a stout butler coming, a freckin' maid answered, that's all the wood there is. And she said softly, well, I fetch you your egg in here. And I love this photograph of Mabel just lounging on um, along there with the fur coat. This fur coat is very significant. She bought it with her very first cell of her watercolour. And she bought the fur coat and it literally went everywhere with her after that sale. That was a very important one to her. But poor old Mabel, apart from the fur coat, which really was very practical to keep her warm, she lived a very frugal lifestyle in the castle. One visualises her, as I said, with a big coat, a Persian rug around to keep her warm, having a boiled egg and a few potatoes for her dinner, using only a few rooms. Gone were the days of footmen and butlers, there had been about 30 members of staff in her younger days to look after the family. And it was against this backdrop and very sound advice that she decided to shoulder the responsibility and take on the estate and the overdrafts. And she says in her unfinished autobiography, A Society is Bent, published in 1964, my old house, the grey Victorian castle stood empty. It had been left to me and I made up my mind to go and live in it. In a really brave effort, she recalls going to the High Court in Dublin to contest the death duties. And the death duties were about just over £42,000. In the end, she won and she returned home to run the estate and for generations of her family had done before. In just six years, she'd actually cleared the overdrafts and two sets of death duties. What an amazing achievement. Although she had a farm managers and a head gardener, she had to become a businesswoman in her own right and make the place pay for itself. At this time, she changed her name from Sorby back to Ansley because she wanted to maintain the family name for the future. And she single mindedly and single handedly saved Castle Wellen from financial disaster at this point. She was also still working on her natural gift of art, which was shining through at this period. And from about 1900, she'd be producing wonderful watercolours and she went on to exhibit them in the Belfast Art Society. In fact, she later became a vice president of the society in 1924. But as we can see from this watercolour here, many of her watercolours reflected her love of the Mourns. She's always coming back to the Mourns, no matter what, in her artwork and no matter where she is. Well, she had another wonderful talent, which I suppose she's more frequently known about these days, and that is wood engraving. And wonderful examples of it. She actually went along only to study a little bit of wood engraving in 1921. She in, actually went to a course in the Central London School of Art and Crafts. And by 1923, she had become a member of the London Society of Wood Engravers. So great was her talent. 
and she really did a lot of book illustration at this period and it was not uncommon for this style of uh, illustration to be part of it and indeed a book that links to County Down and near us here is the County Down Songs and Poems by Richard Rowley. We know Rowley Meadow and maybe we remember Brook Cottage, well that is where uh, Richard Rowley lived. And the book has wonderful woodcuts by Mabel and she illustrated some others as well. She illustrated, for example, a book of Scottish poems that would have been by Robert Burns in his native dialect. And she did that in 1925. And the songs were actually selected by uh, A.E. Copert. And she also put lovely wood engravings in that gorgeous book. Well, that's fine. She's getting on well with her wood engravings. But Jerry, I'm afraid, is starting to give her a bit of trouble or Gerald. Um, he then takes over the castle in about 1925, and in 1927, he married a Lady Elizabeth Jocelyn from Tullymore. When um, Mabel got to this stage of his first marriage, uh, and she obviously hoped it would be the, la the only one, um, she relinquished her interest in the castle, and she decided to move away and let Jerry build a life uh, with Lady Elizabeth. And what did she do? She moved to Rathfryland. And she built herself a little cottage and she called it Sleeve na Man. And it was a little whitewashed cottage with great views of the moorlands once again. And in this beautiful little cottage, basic cottage, she shared it with Miss Kate Fisher. Now, Kate Fisher had been her neighbour from her Shimra River or the Myrtle Lodge days. And they had a wonderful companionship and she called her Fish affectionately. Well, they enjoyed Rath Island life. And woodcuts continued. Uh, Mabel bought herself a second-hand printing press. She printed her own artwork. She exhibited in Belfast, Dublin and London. She, but she still kept in close contact with Castle Wellen and its people. And in fact, in 1933, the primary school in Castle Wellen, just beside St Paul's Church, was opened by her. But there were problems again, and it was Jerry. 1936, Jerry and his wife divorced. Mabel was very sad about this and what did she do? She came back to running the estate and the castle again. But her own artwork and interest continued and probably was a good uh, thing to keep her going. She was a very close friend of William Connor and in fact in 1932 William Connor and herself worked on a wonderful pageant, the 1500th anniversary of the landing of St Patrick at Seoul. And actually, Connor and herself worked on a wonderful pageant of costumes for an exhibition that was actually held at Castle Ward, the National Trust property on the grounds of Strangford Lock. Apart from the 1930s and all this work going on, Mabel was a very, she was a very widely travelled lady in the 30s and 40s. And she visited many, many countries, living fairly basically, not in very fancy places, really. She went to Malta, Egypt, Cyprus. South Africa, Australia and New Zealand. What an amazing achievement for a woman of her time. But even within all this traveling and these beautiful, uh, between watercolors and wood engravings that she was doing, she's always harking back to County Down. The similarities to County Down are constantly made to its people, its activities and its scenery. She often says she's homesick for County Down and the Mourns. Well, let's think what happened in the 1940s, the early 40s for Mabel. Well, Jerry had managed to get himself married again. In 1941, Jerry married Mary MacDonald from Carlow. And so he took back to running the estate and the castle. Then because of World War II, Mabel had to make some changes to her own life. Uh, and I suppose with the marriage of Jerry, she wanted to change anyway. And she moved to Lombard Street in Belfast. At this time, we have that gorgeous uh, painting of uh, Lady Mabel. That's the one by my William Connor, and I think it's one of my favourite paintings of her. But at the time, the castle and park, but not the garden, was taken over by the military. The castle was actually being prepared uh, during that early period of World War II for people evacuated from Belfast. All the arrangements were in place, Mabel tells us, but at five o'clock on the day that it was going to happen, the military and the army just marched in. So 1942 was a very rough and tough year for Mabel. 
She had bombings in Belfast to contend with, living in a very basic apartment in Belfast, Con continuous disputes with dear old Jerry, and an exhausted Mabel moved to New Zealand. She'd already visited New Zealand and she rather liked the country. So it was very like Ireland and she really thought she might be happy if she moved there. So the late 1940s, Mabel's on the move again. And this time, she first of all arrives in Nelson in New Zealand. She was distressed and frustrated on her arrival there. She was unable to obtain woodblocks when she first got there. But our Mabel wasn't going to be put off. She had an idea. She was not going to be daunted by this, so she took up the linoleum from the floorboard and started to cut into that. Now, I'm sure if you had her as a tenant, you wouldn't have been overly happy at this stage. But anyway, she got on with it. When she was in Nelson, she decided it was too, um, I suppose, urban like for her. And she decided to move to a very much more remote area of New Zealand called Tataka. It's about 75 miles from Nelson. And she really, as I said, loved New Zealand. She described it as green and lush, just as Ireland. Her artwork really was very significant at this period, both her wood colour engravings and her watercolours. And she stayed and worked and did all this beautiful work in New Zealand until 1953. She loved to go out into the bush and have expeditions in the bush. And she would say it would give her great scope for her work. And she said when she went to those different bush expeditions, it reminded her of the moors and the rivers and the mountains in the moors. At this period, she often laments about Jerry or Gerald, stating that she tried to make everything possible for him. But I just came to get so far away from him because I realised there was nothing more I could do. She did continue with regular correspondence to Jerry and family. And in Takata, in South Island, New Zealand, she's remembered years after she left and how they remember her was driving her invalid carriage up and over Takata Hill. Um, the road apparently was extremely rough and uneven, very steep and extremely perilous. And she was in what we would almost call an invalid carriage and it was worked by hand. But it just demonstrates her sheer determination and courage, I suppose, that she was going to keep going and make sure, although she was still in ill health, she was going to get to those wonderful scenes and get on with her painting and her love of that. But 1953, really, she uh, decided her health, which had never been great anyway, um, she better leave New Zealand and go a bit closer to home. And she decided to return and she moved actually to Suffolk. Now, her choice of Suffolk and Long Melford was purely and simply because her half-sister Claire actually lived there and she'd always kept in close contact with Claire. Her other sister, Constance, that you saw earlier, she went on to become Constance Mallison, a wonderful actress, and she was actually the mistress of Bernard Russell, and she was based in London. Mabel remained in Suffolk in that long Melford, and we've got some views of it there, until her death in 1959. But she regularly visited uh, Castle Wellen and other parts of Ireland, and especially Carlo. She seems to have kept very close with Jerry's second wife, the MacDonald family, who were originally from Carlo. And of course, she had uh, grandchildren living there. In 1956, however, Mabel drew up a deed to revoke all interest in the castle and the domain. And she kept up uh, a lot of correspondence with her eldest grandchild, who was Margaret, who was the uh, who actually became a trustee of the estate. And she also was a very well respected artist and would you believe wood engraver as well. But as I said, uh, Mabel relinquished all other titles to it. For her uh, gravestone, she asked Jerry to make sure it was Bally McGrehan granite. She wanted that, and she's buried in Long Melford in Suffolk. And at her grave, Claire, her half sister, planted some beautiful rock flowers in red, purple, and violet to remind her of the beautiful morns and the beautiful landscapes. Uh, the Times obituary in June 1959 acknowledged her death and talked about her and the link with the Victorian period. And it said, Mabel disdained publicity, but she had a profound love of beauty, nature and art. Her philosophy was, what one can do without is best to go without. And in conclusion, we do remember her in Castle Wellen and in the grounds. 
with this beautiful Ulster History Society blue plaque beside the gates going into those beautiful Ansley Gardens. And there's the Ansley monogram right beside the gates there. What about my own kind of interest in Mabel? Well, it really sparked off for me in, 19, in 2015 when I was privileged to actually see Mabel's story told by the actor writer Marie Connolly of the Kabosh Theatre Company in the grounds, garden and hall of Castle Wellen Castle on a most beautiful sunny November day. And the story really reflected her life punctuated by both privilege and personal tragedy and a lot of sadness in her later years. I was particularly struck as I sat and listened to that story and followed around the gardens by the fact that back in the Victorian days, this aristocratic, largely homeschooled and educated woman not only acquired professional skills, largely considered to be a male preserve, but went on to produce such high quality work and is exhibited worldwide. For me, Mabel was ahead of her time in so many ways, but for her home place, a place apart in Castle Wellen is her lasting legacy to the, us who are privileged to live in such a beautiful place. And I suppose her other legacy has to be her wonderful woodcuts, because their legacy are for all of us to say and enjoy the superb landscapes and scenery that make up the county down of her life. So I hope you think that Mabel saved Castle Wellen for us and we have here an extremely gifted and talented lady. And I would like to acknowledge uh, some references that I used for this talk. First of all, Robert Trotter and the Lacale Review Journal from 2000, number 13, which had a beautiful article on Lady Mabel. Secondly, a more recent book about her, The Artist and Aristocrat by Diane Egerton, published in 2010. Her own unfinished autobiography published after her death, As the Sight is Bent. The County Down Songs and Poems by Richard Rowley from 1924. And a, Apollo in Morn, a play in one act that Mabel also did some woodcuts for. And finally, my thanks to the library staff in Downpatrick, Castlewell and Newcastle, who despite lockdown, managed to give me the books that I wanted. And finally, thanks to Tully Moore Football Club, to Aidan and to Andy for asking me to do this talk and convincing me I could do it. Thank you very much for listening. That was brilliant, Marion. Thanks very much. Very rich and interesting history there. Um, so I'll open the floor to questions. If anybody wants to unmute themselves, feel free to do so or put your messages into the chat and I can read them out. Um, message from Lily there, very informative and interesting talk and brilliant photos. So over to the floor, anybody have any questions for Marianne on that? Just a lot of thank yous coming through at the minute, Marion. <laughs> I'm, I'm very proud to see that one has come from New Hampshire in the States there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a question just when you were mentioning Winston Churchill, kind of, there was, there was lots of interesting points throughout that, but I wondered if there was any evidence that he ever came to visit or was that, that relationship always London based? Um, I, I only know about it around the time that she met Gerald. And I assumed that when she met Gerald, her husband, that she was moving in those sort of circles and met him. Yeah, that's the only evidence I had. But it was obviously very significant because she's mentioned it in, in her book. Yeah. We have a quiet bunch tonight. We should get lots of questions. <laughs> I told them not to ask <laughs> any hard questions. <laughs> so Gillian's... Marion, um, I, I much enjoyed your, there's a couple of cross with my own family. My youngest daughter at the moment's in New Zealand and we love the moors. So she's got that out in New Zealand with her. She's, she's in the North Island, so some good connections. And, and fortunately, we, we can connect with phone WhatsApp. My goodness, in, in those days, all those years ago, the connections were impossible and took so long to do so. I much appreciate your insight. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thought there might be some questions about the more interesting members of the Ansley family, like Jerry's regular marriages or something like that, you know? 
But maybe maybe it's too recent history for you to ask me that. Okay. I... <laughs> Marion, could I ask you? I was just about to ask you about that. And Jerry and and indeed his the, the current family. What is the situation? Who is, in a sense, now the responsible Ansley person? And indeed, what, if any, ownership have they of the castle and the grounds at the moment? Well, and, when, and one further question. Yeah. Are they still involved in the appointment of a rector in St John's Parish in Newcastle? No, those questions, I honestly can't answer, John. When uh, Mabel took over the castle and um, Francis had died, obviously, the, the line of the Earl on that side of it went to some cousins, and there's obviously still a, a Lord Ansley. I think it's Richard at the moment, isn't it, Frank? Um, so there are some, and there's some connections and family um, it's still living in Carlow, I think. So, there, But how much uh, connection they have, because Jerry obviously sold the castle eventually um, to the Forestry Commission and gave various things like sold off a bit of Donard Mountain to the National Trust and, you know, a whole load of things around the late 50s, early, well, early 60s, really. So I honestly wouldn't know enough about that, but there might be somebody on the chat who knows tonight. Um, you know, there's there's obviously lots in St Paul's Church to do with the records of the Ansley family that I've seen, but I'm not entirely sure. When we first came to live in County Down, People talked about paying ground rent to the Ansleys, John. So uh, I'm as, not we, sure. as we did in Newcastle up until there was a time when then you were allowed to buy out your ground rent. rent. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, I think I missed a question in the chat there. Sorry. Yeah, there, there's uh, one from Julian. Um, did she have any input into the gardens and why was the, the blue plaque placed there? Um, I think more, I don't, I mean, it was her father, of course, who really uh, was the huge influence on the gardens. Um, he was really the main person. So I would imagine the Ulster History Society um, uh, decided to put it there because of the link to her father. Funny enough, when I went looking for the plaque, um, I was convinced it was in the, the farmyard at Castle Wellen and kept looking for it. And it took me ages to find it up at the, at the gardens, you know. Somebody else has asked about, as the site is bent, yeah. um, what the significance of that title is. Um, that I'm not sure about um, uh, uh, why she, she called it that. I haven't, I, I'm not, I, I don't know if anybody else in the chat knows that. I personally don't know why she called it that. And a, a point of information about Winston Churchill, by the way, uh, somebody on the chat tells me he had a family or a house he came to in Carnlock. So maybe he did come to Castleton. Okay. And uh, Marion, um, can you ask Marion where Ainsley, Ainsley Gate Crest is? Um, okay. In the it's gate, on the... At, uh, on the way into the, uh, yeah, when you go into the gardens of Castle Ellen, yeah, part of the structure of the gate, it's actually built into the gate, yeah. Very good. Yeah, I think I've seen that. Um, so James, uh, Marion, sorry I was late in saying on. Um, I wish I had heard more as I often studied the portrait in the ECD dining room, knowing little of her achievements. So. Oh, right, right. Well, I'll just have to give off to James later. Uh, later. Imagine arriving late, James. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I know him well. I'm, I'm, I'm being naughty there. Uh, ah, another one. Somebody says they saw Richard who would be the most recent Ansley link that I know of as well. And he moved to Spain in the 1980s. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've heard reference to him from people in Newcastle for sure, but there's still um, uh, connections. I mean, I know uh, he's got a son and a grandson, so there's certainly still uh, 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 an heir apparent, Michael actually, isn't it? There's um, two Michaels coming along, so. There's another oh, three one. Three Michaels, three Michaels, sorry. Michael's obviously very significant. Oh, sorry. Churchill owned the Londonderry Arms in Carnlough. There we go. A lovely, uh, a lovely hotel to stop off in. Indeed. Anyone wants to ask anything directly, feel free to unmute yourself. 
Oh, right. Richard now lives in Morocco, right? The family are so important to the golf club in gifting the land to the club. OK, I mean, that is one thing that obviously I only talked about Mabel, but the amount of things in Castlewellan and in Newcastle that were gifted by the Ansley family to the towns and to the people is extremely significant. And, um, you know, I talked just about Mabel today, but really um, you go through many significant buildings in Castlewellan and Newcastle and it, it's Ansley's who gifted the land and obviously um, you know, uh, the Donard Lodge that was up in uh, Donard Park. Apparently, um, it was the most amazing house. And it's a pity the National Trust uh, didn't take it over as a wonderful property for South Down. And um, the views from it would beat the Bay, the Bay of Naples, it was described as. But uh, a few people on probably remember having parties there in the 60s. So I'll say no more. <laughs> Andy Hall could probably tell us a few stories about it, you know. My, if I may say, the £42,000 fees way back in those days, yeah. what would that be equivalent to today? And that took some paying off in a six year period. Certainly did. It certainly did, yeah. An amazing achievement, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, she really did live a very frugal lifestyle. And um, she, even in Castle Well, but also when she went to Connemara, I read about the cabin cottage that she had in Connemara by Killarney Harbour and Round Linan. And it really was extremely basic. And although we hear about her traveling to all these different countries, she was always living in very basic accommodation. She wasn't really um, living the high life at all. You know, very frugal style. And a very shy lady, apparently. So I'd love to have met her. Uh, I see Mariam's uh, asked an interesting question. Is her work exhibited anywhere? Do you know? Marion, is her work exhibited anywhere? Um, well, the Ulster Museum have a huge collection of her wood engravings. And I think one of the biggest collections, um, her granddaughter, Margaret, who married into the Ogilvy family, uh, right up in the north of Scotland. I think that she also has some in her private collection, I understand. But I think for the public, um, some years ago, the Ulster Museum did have um, an exhibition of her wonderful woodcuts. Uh, and I know it's a very significant number that they have there. But the watercolours, um, I had a real struggle to find many examples of where they are because a lot of her works exhibited um, in uh, museums in New Zealand as well. A, a very high amount of her work can be found in New Zealand. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, somebody else is reminding me that the Ulster Museum do display her woodcuts from time to time. Yeah. OK. Well, we have, uh, we have time for a few more questions, but Marianne, I wanted to ask you if you're OK with giving me the references that you mentioned there to the, yes. the few books. I, I can put them up on the on the website so yeah, everybody sure. can yeah. see them afterwards. Um, yeah. I'll put the I'll put the website on the chat just for anyone that wants to copy that. Yeah, I'll say, yeah, I'll post I'll post them to you. Yeah, you can send them to me afterwards, and yeah, I'll, sure. I'll add them. Yeah. Um, yeah. along with this recording too. So, um, any more questions from anyone? If not, then maybe we shall uh, close the call. Um, okay. Thank you very much, Marion. Um, oh, somebody's just asked, are the talks available after the event? They are. I, I will upload all the talks to the website. So um, anybody that wants to view them afterwards, and I'll try to put any supporting um, information gathered throughout them in there. So... Uh, that should be available to anybody um, that's missed them or you want to see them again. Um, and um, yeah, just to remind everyone, um, thanks very much for joining us. Um, but there's still four more talks. If, if you are interested, we have another two this week, tomorrow and Thursday. Um, one on Blaberries and Binders Cove, which is the arche archaeology of Sleeve Croob. Um, then on Thursday, we have Native Herbs of the Morns. Um, 
on Wednesday of Easter week, we, we've got the Archaeology of Death, um, which is the archaeology and links to the, the Mourns, um, and the history of Kilkeel Harbour that finishes off on Thursday the 8th of April. So um, please join us again um, if you're interested in any of those. And thank you, Marion, for the talk tonight. It's, it was wonderful. And thanks, everybody, for joining. There's lots of applause. Thank you. Well, thanks, Aidan and Andy in particular. Thank you for all your help as well. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Well done, Marion. Thank you.